Um, I'm really honoured to be doing this book launch. In fact, it's the first book I've ever launched, and it's one of the great um, pleasures, of course, of working so closely with Peter um, that I have this great honour. And if I, when I actually look out across the room, I know there's lots of people um, that uh, know Peter really well, and uh, but there's also maybe, and I hope, uh, many people that don't know um, Peter as well as many of us here do. So I want to spend the time saying a few, few things about Peter and then a few thoughts and impressions I've had about the book, which I have studiously read um, and I found no problem getting through it in just a very short time. So I think all of you know um, that Peter is not only a superb scientist but an extraordinary Australian and of course is most well known for being awarded the Nobel Prize in 1996, which he shared with um, Swiss colleague Ralph Zinkenagel for the discovery of how our immune system recognises things that are foreign, um, like viruses, which he went on to spend his whole career studying. And um, those of you also, I think most of you will know that um, Peter has not only travelled extensively, but he's lived in many parts of the world. Um, he was born in Brisbane and, and these are his words, often says how desperate he was to leave Queensland. And he managed to do that very, very well and together with his wife Penny, that features very strongly in the book, um, microbiologist, librarian and Peter's uh, trusty travel companion. Um, they've lived in, in some extraordinary places, Edinburgh, Philadelphia, Canberra, Memphis and um, now Melbourne. And so I know that we at the University of Melbourne were delighted when he chose to come back here in 1999. And he spent sort of pretty much the, the next um, decade travelling between um, two laboratories, one based at uh, Memphis at St Jude's Children's Hospital and the other um, based here at the University of Melbourne. And in 2014, of course, the Doherty Institute was, um, was opened for those of you that are new to the Institute, it's your first visit here. It's a joint venture of the University of Melbourne and Royal Melbourne Hospital. We have over 700 staff working entirely on infection and immunity. Two of Peter's great passions. So it was just wonderful that we were able to name the Institute in his honour. And he stays, um, works here and um, is a patron of the Institute and a great inspiration um, to all of us. So several years ago, Peter stopped working um, in the lab uh, and uh, really continues um, to travel. I know that and I know he's planning to cut back his travel, but he really is one of Australia's great thought leaders on, on not just science, but really about evidence-based science and particularly climate change, another strong theme in the book. And now, of course, writes books, which brings us to the launch of his sixth book, um, The Incidental Tourist. And um, many of you are, of course, getting great pleasure from seeing Peter looking incredibly uncomfortable and awkward <laughs> on a horse that looks much too small for him. And I actually really like the outfit, you know, Peter on holiday with his um, sneakers and the relaxed shirt, and um, but still looking a little uncomfortable. <laughs> And um, I've also had the benefit of hearing Peter already speak about the book. Um, he was on Radio National on the weekend, um, and I accidentally happened to be, incidentally happened to be in the car and heard him speak, saying that his book is not really about science, um, it's not really about history, it's not really a travel book, it's um, a memoir of sorts. And uh, it is a really interesting read for so many reasons, not just in um, understanding a bit more about Peter and um, how his brilliant mind works a bit, but also some extraordinary experiences that um, he's had from his travels. Um, his travels are largely through the lens of scientists, and he takes us all over the world, just starting in Bergamo, a small town in Italy that many of us would never get a chance to go to to New York, to Eastern Europe, to Asia, and back again. In fact, many of the places he's, he visits, he has a really deep understanding of, because for reasons such as being on the scientific advisory board, he's gone back again and again. Now, if you didn't know much about Peter or about um, what scientists do, um, after reading the book, you might start wondering whether this guy actually does any work. I mean, you know, he's on the road quite a bit, I should say, though, these are vignettes from four decades of travel, 
And for those of you that are not scientists, this is really a big part of what we do, communicating with what we're working on, hearing the latest ideas from people, networking, and of course, um, most of us having a good time while we're doing it, which Peter certainly has done. Um, but Peter brings a whole other lens to it. As a Renaissance man, deep understanding of science, but also of history, of art, of architecture, of the environment, and all those stories get weaved into um, the various places he visits. Um, the book starts actually with a lot of uh, fascinating details on plane travel. Not something I've thought too much about. I just check in, hop on the plane, get off again. But Peter has analysed the size of the seats, how they've changed over time, where the best place is to sit so you don't get sick and don't get the flu or TV while you're travelling. And, um, and, and actually some really beautiful um, stories about what travel would have been like in the 1950s when it was all very um, first, first class and what we've had to put up with as travels become far more common. And he tells these stories, as I said, through um, uh, the lens of a whole range of um, other disciplines. And throughout um, the book, a few of his passions come, come through strongly, um, related to music and opera, of course with science, and, um, and a lot about the environment, though I know he's feeling a little guilty revealing the massive impact his carbon footprint he has had with him and Penny circling the world so many times. I also really like the way that there was nothing jaded about Peter's travels. Many people I know travel enormously. They go in and out of a country and are a bit oblivious to where they are, but you still see Peter's excitement about a new place, um, learning more. He's got such an incredible thirst for knowledge and incredible curiosity, and also his intense interest in the people that he works with. But for me, um, some of the, the highlights, and I'll just uh, briefly um, comment on some parts, are more about the personal um, highlights, uh, the personal insights into Peter. I actually really love reading that most of Peter's travel is not on his own. Um, it's pretty much always, or certainly the, the stories in the book are always with his um, great soulmate, Penny. And my favourite anecdote in the book was when poor Penny's bag set off the explosive detector. And apparently, this was triggered by contact with a sparkler from one of their grandchild's party. And this event actually went on to haunt Penny um, for um, many, many visits to the US, where she used to get pulled over by security every time, apparently. And um, I like the way um, Peter describes it, that she was now on a dangerous granny's security list because of some sparklers at a kid's party. So I, I kind of had this great image of uh, Penny being the sort of uni bomber um, behind this very innocent um, facade. He, in, he has a chapter titled The um, Practiced Traveller, where he gives a few pattern tips, um, and uh, including you know, only traveling with carry-on, doing a ruthless um, second pack, quick, drying underwear, a little bit too much information, <laughs> um, and ways to wash and hang a single shirt that you travel with. I have to say, none of this had any resonance whatsoever with me. Peter knows how I travel, with two big bags and being prepared for every single um, possible event. So perhaps his travel tips are just for a few in the audience. Um, and finally, the last chapter, um, he ends with some reflections on his flights back to Australia, coming into different ports. Um, and I mentioned earlier, uh, when Peter talks about his early childhood, how desperate he was to get out of Brisbane as a young man. But I very much felt at the end, um, Peter's great warmth and um, attachment to Australia, which is now definitely um, his home. And he describes um, the dry farming lands that always look very different depending on what season you arrive in Melbourne, the glittering beaches south of Brisbane, um, the brilliant view of the um, Sydney Opera House. He gave that a little bit too much um, time, I thought, being a proud Melbourneian, but as a symbol of um, very modern Australia. And I think that um, although he's such an extraordinary um, global citizen, Australia is very much his home. And I liked the um, last closing line, which I'll just read. Um, he writes, An inevitable element of travel writing is in rediscovering, even reinventing the voyage. In the end, 
though especially for anyone who values complexity, the basic theme of the finished product will likely echo Satchmo, the trumpeter Louis Armstrong, as he sings, What a Wonderful World. And I couldn't help thinking, reading this, um, what a wonderful life Peter Doherty has had and how fantastic he's sharing this, some of it with us through the Incidental Tour. So, great pleasure to launch the book. Thanks very much. And, and my idea is that a carry-on ship, it's, it's kind of like uh, Doctor Who's TARDIS, you know, it's very small on the outside, very large on the inside. doesn't quite work. But you can see the result of that here. You know, I'm, I'm travelling to, I'm in a scientific meeting, and uh, I've got the button-down blue shirt, the tan chinos. What you don't see is the black reef jacket and, and black shoes. That's standard travel for an American scientist of my age. If you see someone like this in a departure lounge, you know they're an American scientist of a certain age. That, that's it. And, and then, you know, I've got this pair of sneakers, and I don't know where the hat came from. That, that is a horse, it's not a pony, and it's real and it's not photoshopped. And the hills in the background are the Himalayas. We're in the Himalayan high plains up near Kunming. And, uh, they offered us a little post-conference tour. Penny was along for the trip, and, and we took it, and it was really a lot of fun, but one of the things they offered was the chance to ride a horse. Now, I hadn't been on a horse for about 35 years, for very good reasons, because I became convinced when I was young and rode horses a bit that they were always trying to kill you. And, and here, I foolishly took up the option. So. I learned to ride horses. I learned to ride big Australian stock horses, big whalers, and, and with long stirrups and uh, round, rounding up sheep. And, and you sit on the horse like a sack of potato. So you're going like this all day. <laughs> it's, it's, it's slightly more interesting than being in a scientific meeting. And, uh, <laughs> and basically, I got on this thing, but they. They, they didn't have adjustable stirrup levers, they tied up the stirrups with a bit of rope. So I'm sitting on it like a flat race jockey, feeling like a complete fool, and I didn't fall off. Uh, but I said this in the book, and I wrote a chapter about it, and said, I made a complete fool of myself on this horse. So, of course, the first question was, have you got a picture of that? <laughs> and, and so I had no, I mean, Sally was very nice about this, but there was no option. She, they were going to pick the, the, the photograph that made me look the most stupid. So, which is very appropriate, very appropriate. So, um, so the scientific life, we're all in a, this travel thing. Uh, to some extent, um, I started my first international jet flight in 1971, and before that, uh, as, as Sharon said, when, when Mark Oliphant, for instance, who became the first chair of, uh, director of the Research School of Physics at the Australian National University, worked on the Manhattan Project before that, was an eminent professor in Britain, when he flew out uh, after the war to take up his new job, he flew in a converted Lancaster bomber. Mark was fairly tall. He could put his back against one side of the plane and brace his feet on the other side of the plane. So that's a narrow body. You know, it didn't fly on anything like that. But we've flown all around the planet, gone to various places, went back to Berlin maybe 10 or 15 times between about 1978 to, uh, to about 2010. Saw the transition from the... Um, uh, yeah, can you hear? <laughs> saw the transition from the, the communist east where you had to go through checkpoint Charlie and all that sort of thing. Uh, then we were there the year before the wall came down, the year after the wall came down. My early memories of Berlin were of the Reichstag building which had been burnt out under the Nazis and uh, was totally destroyed. It was still like that. They fixed that up later on, of course. Then, of course, they brought uh, the German capital back to Berlin, and I was there quite frequently on the scientific advisory committee through that. And the whole thing rebuilt. Really an extraordinary transition, and uh, you really wondered how it was that that wonderful city, because it is a wonderful city, and when they reconstructed the area around the Brandenburg Gate and the Apple Hotel where we stayed when you, how that city could be taken over by, by the Nazis. And I think there's kind of a, a warning there for us in, in thinking about how we behave politically and, and the sort of situations we can get into. So the travel, I try not to write about the negative experiences. 
uh, like when Penny broke her toe on the bed because it was had a lot of projection. If you stay in a boutique hotel, <laughs> boutique, boutique hotels are hotels that are built in inconvenient spaces in inconvenient ways, so they're called boutique. And if you stay in a boutique hotel, one of the first things you want to do is in daylight, inspect it very carefully to see where you're going to do this or damage you get out in the middle of the night. You also have this problem of trying to find where the light switches are in some modern hotels. Uh, and also the blinds. Are they electric blinds? Do you pull them down? Is there a button? Where's the button? How do you turn off that final light above the bed? I think we've all contended with this. I, I gave up years ago trying to set the clock radio alarm. They're all different. There is not a single hotel that replicates the clock radio and the system for setting it anywhere in the world. And I think a lot of hotel rooms are actually designed by people who've never stayed in a hotel. Or either that or they're just hostile. Um, but I don't say that in the book. It's a very nice, uh, chatty, amiable book. My other five books have all been about science. The last one, The Knowledge Wars, was about the practice of science. They're all kind of serious. Uh, this one's... Um, Maybe my first and last travel book, who knows. Um, so, is that enough? Yeah. <laughs> um, what else does this tell you about? Well, I found out lots of things. Liverpool, I, it's a book about travelling to places where no one wants to go. I mean, there are, there's, there's chapters on Kansas City, Essen in the Ruhr, uh, Zbed in southern Hungary. These are places you've never heard of, right? Or if you have heard of, you haven't to go there. They're all fascinating places. Kansas City has the world's biggest shuttlecocks. They're that tall. Uh, they're done by Clay Zoldenberg, the uh, wonderful uh, uh, sculptor who did the enormous clothes pegs, for instance, you'll see in Philadelphia. So I think that's the point. You go to places, you don't have much expectation on them, you're going to a scientific meeting. We all do this. You're not thinking about where you go. You haven't planned ahead. Unless maybe you're sharing this much more organised. And, and you get there, and then you find something really interesting and intriguing. And that's, that's been a kind of fun of it. But uh, then, again, there's been lots and lots of meetings where I've gone, haven't done anything interesting, got on the plane, left again, come home, and, uh, and that's it, of course. So this is the experience we've all had or will have as time goes by. Maybe I've done more of it than most, but many people, many senior scientists, uh, travel more than I do and always have done. It's part of the business. If you're heading a big group, you've got to be there at the meetings, you've got to be seen, you've got to talk, you've got to see what's going on. So it is part of our way of life, if you like. So anyway, that's the book. So, thank you. Thank you.